hello guys. Uh, thank you very much everybody for tuning in here. Um, just letting us all catch up. And uh, we're going to get started here in just a little bit. Just want to make sure that this is all working. Can I get some uh, some feedback on the chat? Can everybody hear me? Everybody see what's going on right now? This is our first time trying this. Uh, my first time trying this, obviously. So I'd like to see what's, uh, what's happening, what's going on. Good, awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. All right, so we'll wait a few more minutes, obviously. Hope everyone has a uh, cold beverage with them. I'm drinking a uh, Lawson's Finest Liquids Sip of Sunshine at the moment. Right on. Thank you there, Courtney. What's up, Sherps? We got Maddie, Maddie Moo. Little Chris Frangiosa. It's good when the boss man's there. Johnny Parisi with the bush comments. All right, all right. Things are clear. Things are clean. All right. So we'll probably give another minute or two here before we uh, we start getting into some time. So I can't hear any of you, obviously. So feel free to use that uh, the live chat. Ask me all kinds of questions. I'm going to keep this very, very... Thank you there, Joshua. Mr. Sunday, what's up? Um, like I said, I'm going to keep this really laid back, really open-ended. Um, and just kind of, we're going to hang out here and do whatever we're going to do. Um... I don't really have any time constraints or limits on this. I'm just going <laughs> to... There you go, Jansen. Mr. Zach, live from Colorado. What's up, buddy? Um, really, what it, what it comes down to is, uh, like I said, we're just here to, to kind of hang out. This is obviously a weird situation we're all in right now. These are new times, unprecedented times. And, um, you know, we're just trying to do something fun. I think Neil did a fantastic job last week on Instagram Live. And uh, now we're going to try to do this on the YouTube kind of platform tonight. So, glad to see this is working for everyone. Again, there is a delay. So, uh, if someone asks the questions, it's going to be a second until I'm able to answer them. But uh, we're starting to get more and more people filtering in here. Like I said, I figure we'll give it until about six. Uh, excuse me, seven thirty-five or so. And we'll probably start getting uh, getting things going. Obviously, things are getting rowdy over there in the Jansen household this evening. I can't pull off the deep V like you always did, Zach. That was a uh, that was a that was a classic Penn State move of you. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave that go. And Courtney's wine drunk, so. Thanks, thanks, thanks for uh, tuning in there, Court. Big Stevie Spurgeon, Dicky himself. You are not excited to tie nymphs. You are, uh, you are lying. And, uh, you know, what can you do about that? And to uh, everyone else again, I like uh, Bob with Wine and Bugs tonight. That's awesome. David, we're going to try to try to shore up some of the issues you've been having there. And uh, let's see what else we got here. Frank, I believe last week's was recorded, Frank Buckley. Uh, we are going to try to upload that. Um... So we're gonna we're gonna jump on that. Dennis, thank you for tuning in. Appreciate that. Again, uh, Mike, thank you very much as well for tuning in. We're gonna try to 
try to make this worthwhile. Joe, how's it going, my friend? Good to see you, or talk to you, I guess. All right, so we're gonna get started. Like I said, I think uh, it's about you know pretty good, uh, pretty good level for here, for sure right now, and we'll see what happens. But uh, tonight we're gonna tie some stoneflies. So there's a million different stonefly patterns out there, uh, and I think the kind of Bob Bonner, what's up, Bob? Um, I think you can get really, really complicated and involved with a lot of these flies. Um, and at the same time, I like to keep things pretty darn simple. So we're gonna just tie essentially um, a, a pat's, you know, a pat's rubber legs, uh, a girdle bug, uh, a turd, whatever you want to call them. They're very, very simple patterns. But we're gonna do three pretty unique variations on them, and see how this all shape shapes up. What's up, Troop? Good to see you, man. Um, so in the vice right now, uh, and I'm gonna try to adjust some things here in just a moment. Let's see how this all works out. Give me a second to see. If everyone could let me know if uh, that's a pretty good angle. I try to go with a fairly uh, solid shirt here so everyone can see what's happening. Just let me know what's going on. Cheers to you there, uh, Miss uh, Stephanie Hernandez. Like I said, just waiting for that delay to catch up. And again, this is work work well for everybody. Just a quick uh, thumbs up, yes, no. Thank you, Sherpa. We'll get to that later on. Give me a few more beers, maybe. All right, so, like I said, in the vice right now, this is a TMC 5262. Do not get hung up on individual hook sizes or styles. A lot of this is really going to depend on what's going on. Josh Hollinger, good to see you, man. Um, it really depends on where you're fishing, what you're doing. Um, for me right now, I've got... Like I said, a size 6, 50, 52, 62 from TMC in here. I'm just trying to get something that's going to be open-ended and, uh, like I said, a little bit on the larger side so everyone can kind of see what's going on. So the first variation we're going to tie is going to be your traditional Pat's rubber legs. Uh, we're going to have no beads, no additional changes whatsoever from kind of the, the normal fly. So, uh, size 6, we're going to start with some lead wire here. This is uh, 025. You know, 25 thousandths, and we're going to start that at the rear portion of the hook shank and work that forward. You can vary your wraps, obviously, to pay it depending upon your fishing situation. You know, that's probably somewhere in that 15 ish range, maybe. For thread tonight, we're going to be using uh, UTC 70 in black. You can certainly go heavier, you can certainly go lighter. Um, well, I wouldn't really go any lighter, honestly, but, uh, 140 is a good substitute as well, but I do like the way, uh, you know, thinner thread, ADOT, 70s, things like that, uh, I just like the way that that kind of finishes on flies. So, we're going to start our thread at the rear portion of the lead, and work our way up and down that a few times, build up a little bit of a thread dam on the front side, work the back, a little bit of a thread dam on the rear side, and break your thread. There's where that 140 comes into play. And continue forward. Do not catch your hook point. Like I just did there. And when you uh when you're securing this in, obviously just regular thread will do just fine, but I really do like to add 
just a little bit of super glue just to really help secure that to the shank of the hook. So I'm using Wopsy's Fly Tire Z-Ment. Um, this is my usually, it's kind of my preferred thread uh, lock, kind of locker as far as super glue goes. There's a lot of different brands out there, a lot of different things you can do. Um, so we're going to build that up with a little bit of a thread base. Again, really just making sure we're providing ourselves a very solid foundation. And then we're going to switch to our tail material. So again, just as I said, don't get hung up on hooks. You know, some people say, oh, you know, the original was tied on a TMCO 102Y. Well, a TMCO 100 will do just fine. Same thing applies to legging material and uh, tail material. So in this case, because it's what I had, the first thing I found, this is going to be hairline life flex leg and body material in brown. Wopsy span flex works just fantastic. Uh, traditional, the, the, the traditional fly was actually tied with uh, round rubber. And you can kind of do whatever works best for you. Silly legs work great. The only issue I've had with rubber is if I, I'll sit down usually in the wintertime and I'll tie a lot of these flies um, for, you know, for guiding and for fishing myself. And those rubber legs eventually do start to rot. Um, so I really prefer to, to run with the standard uh, kind of anything silicone based. So whether that's Spanflex or Lifeflex or, like I said, the same material comes under a bunch of different names. Uh, and this happens to be, like I said, Lifeflex from hairline. So we're going to catch that in the middle. I just, uh, off of this hank here, I ended up uh, cutting half of this off right from the zip tie. And then I double that over and cut that into half. And that's going to end up being both my tails and my antennas. Or one set of legs, doesn't really matter. But you'll see it's pretty long. We're going we're gonna to trim these down. We're going to cut them to length. But um, I usually prefer to leave things pretty long at first. Uh, you can always remove on the stream side, but you can never add. And there are occasionally there's those days where the fish just likes something a little bit kind of a bigger profile. So the, the thing I also want to do is kind of talk about, um, you know, a little bit about how to fish these things. So stoneflies are, are one of those patterns that on average you want to make sure there are some stoneflies in the creek. Uh, there are exceptions to that, for sure. Um, as my buddy Matt would tell you, uh, he's, he's uh, all over the place in the chat here, but, you know, he was fishing a, a creek the other day that doesn't really have a good stonefly population, but it was windy, uh, and he was nymphing and he needed something a little bit heavier to kind of help, help help get his flies down. They put on a girl bug, and uh, within minutes caught a fish. Fish are curious, you know. I, I say this to customers all the time in the shop. If you're, you know, talking about what do we do as humans when we're curious about something, on average, if we're shopping in a store, what are we going to do? We're going to pick it up. We're going to touch the product. We're going to... We're going to look at it, feel it, see what it's all about. Trout don't have hands, and I say this all the time. Trout are simply going to just eat it. <laughs> and it's one of those things where I think, um, you know, a lot of times we might give the fish a little bit too much credit. Um, and having the ability to just try something a little bit new and out of the box is always a good idea. So... So at this point, now I'm going to continue to cut a few more additional Spanflex pieces, and I'm going to use these. With this standard length of um, Life Flex, really is what it is, I so said I cut it in half, double it over, and then cut it in half again. And that gives me my kind of standard length. Like I said, this is a size 6, 2X long hook. You can certainly do these on a 3X long hook, whether that's a Daiichi, a Tiemco, a Partridge, a Gamagatsu, whatever you're using, does not matter. Uh, just as long as you're confident in the hook. For me, I like Tiemco stuff. So, stoneflies are one of those things where, again, I'm usually fishing them where there are stoneflies, but it doesn't need to be that way. So next what we're going to do is we're going to reach for our 
body material. And in this case, that's going to be variegated chenille in coffee and black. I hope everyone can kind of see the color with the light here. And I've pulled off section, you know, 10, 12 inches long, whatever. And what we're going to do is we're going to pull off a section of the material. So we're just left with an exposed core. That's what we're going to tie in here. Just helps to reduce bulk. And as I mentioned before, we kind of build up a bit of a taper, and that's why you'll see me as I'm continuing to talk here. I still keep kind of working on that and just filling things in. I'm going to get up to roughly about the halfway point on the hook shank and just leave my thread there. There's a lot of different ways to tie these, but this just happens to be the way I like to tie them. So this is, again, standard variegated chenille in medium. There's a lot of colors to do this in as well. That's the other thing I was going to mention. So another color I like a lot, brown-yellow. Another color I like a lot, olive coffee. Kind of see that there. This one happens to be the coffee black that we're using right now. You can see it's getting a little thin. Use that one a whole bunch. One of many I have. Don't be afraid to use some with some sparkle in them. If you can kind of see that, there you go. Uh, so this happens to be from Eric's Fly Shop uh, out in West Yellowstone, Montana. Unfortunately, I believe the shop is no longer in existence, but... Um, a lot of different similar options. Wooly bugger chenille, variegated tinsel chenille uh, from Wopsy, from Hairline. A lot, of, a lot of options right there. So, what we're going to do once we've kind of, like I said, we've secured our chenille here, we're just going to start wrapping. So, we have our, our legs, or excuse me, our tails in place. So, I'm going to give this a wrap and a half, and I'm going to pull pretty tight. I'm going to give this another wrap or two. Pull pretty tight. Wrap or two. Pull pretty tight. And this is something that I learned from, oh, geez, wow, uh, from Kelly Callop. Uh, this is obviously some older chenille. Uh, but Kelly is, is spot on. When you wrap a tight body, this is, again, some super old Eric's material. Uh, when you wrap that tight body, it's going to help a lot with the durability of the fly. So, like I said, I unfortunately broke that but yeah see it's just breaking under not very much tension right now so we'll fix that there so we're back in the game alright so moving on we're gonna go to our rubber legs so we're gonna take one of those half of a half sections that we had and we're gonna secure that with a figure eight wrap like we would uh, say essentially a spinner wing so one or two wraps one direction, one or two wraps another direction. Pull them, get them into place, get them situated the way we want them, and tighten down, add some tension. And then what we're going to do is we're going to move just maybe an eye length further up. And we're going to secure that in again with a few tight wraps. Situate that, tighten them up. And then we'll come in here and add our third set of legs. Twist that. Single little X wrap. And move them and manipulate them to where you want them. They don't have to be perfect yet uh, because the chenille is going to do a lot of that work of splitting things up. Just like that. Alright, good. So. Now we're going to continue to wrap our chenille, our newly fixed chenille, after I busted that. Get a wrap or two there, and then we're going to pull our span flex into place here. Nope, don't like that yet. And just use the span flex to spread them out and to manipulate them the way you're, you're wanting to do. Now once I get up to about here, I'm going to tie this off again. And I'm going to jump to the very front, and we're going to add our antenna. For this, all I'm going to do is take a doubled over section like this, and just tie that right in behind the eye of the hook.
All right, we're going to continue with our wrapping. We're going to splay everything out and kind of get these rubber legs where we want them. Caught one of those under there. There we go. Come across the top. Build ourselves a little thread head. Trim off our excess. And then we are going to oh, wait finish. Once we've done that, then we can kind of pull and, and push our legs around. I'm going to take the three sets of legs here, pull them up. You don't want to use too much tension and cut them to length. Go to our rear section again under not too much tension, cut them to length. And go to our forward section, cut them to length. And there we have it, just a big buggy stonefly. I am usually not one to tie in the third set of legs personally. Uh, I did it just for the, the sake of, you know, that's what a stonefly really does look like. And, and uh, like I said, they, they do, in my opinion, look a little bit better that way. But the vast majority of the time, uh, I'm tying in one set of legs on either side and moving on. Trout can't count. I try to explain that to people all the time. They say, oh, you know, well, you know, one mayfly might have three tails and one mayfly might have two tails. Well, it doesn't really matter in my opinion. Uh, I just like to keep things on average pretty darn simple um, and, <clears throat> and continue to uh, to just go fishing. So, like I said, that's completed past rubber legs, number one. Now we're going to move on to variation number two. So in this case, I have a Daiichi 1730, again in a size 6, just keeping them pretty big to show everyone. But, you know, I fish these in a variety of sizes, like in a 1730, for instance, I've got 6s, I've got 8s, you probably can't see that, there you go, 8s, I've got 10s. Again, can't see it, but there you go. So the 1730, as you can kind of see here, is a bent shank. So it's a 3x long nymph hook. And uh, I, I like a lot of times to tie on a 2x long, uh, just because you end up getting a really, really big fly uh, with a 3x long. So... Something we run into a lot in the shop is, you know, someone will say, hey, I need a, you know, a 4X long number 8. Well, most of the time, you know, a 3X long number 6 is going to be essentially the exact same shank length. Uh, and that's usually kind of where I end up fishing a lot of that stuff is just, like I said, 3X long for me is a little bit bigger. Um, but... You know, again, if you're looking for 4X, you can go up a size in a 3. If you're looking for 3X, you can go up a size in a 2. You're going to get more hook gap. You're going to get more substantial wire as far as the gauge of the hook. Uh, and you're going to end up, on average, with a little bit better uh, kind of landing percentage with that wider hook gap and that heavier wire for some bigger fish. So, like I said, the 1730 is fairly unique in the sense that it's you know, a bent shank, you'll see right here about the 70% point, you have a bend down, and uh, with this, when you end up, this is a uh, 3 16 black tungsten bead on here, you can fish them with, obviously you can tie the exact same fly we just did with this bent hook and no tungsten bead, but I really like these because they kind of get the jig hook style effect on a still a larger fly. Uh, there's not many larger jig hooks out there, Eric makes a nice jig hook, as does uh, Daiichi makes the 4660. I forget the Eric's code off the top of my head, but the you know the 4660 is a 90 degree jig hook, so you're you're setting an angle like that. The uh, Eric is also a uh, like I said a 90 degree Daiichi and Eric, but you don't necessarily need to go to like a proper what's up T man. Um, you don't need to go to a proper 90 degree jig. 
to end up with the same effect of trying to you know put a lot more weight on the front side of the hook and, and help roll that over and, and turn that over. So like I said the 1730 is a really really good you know stonefly hook. Also you got to think if you see a stonefly, like say you ever find a stonefly on the bottom of a rock, and you then like toss it back into the current immediately. They usually kind of curl up and start to tumble downstream. Um, the I don't know that the fish necessarily see this hook and say, oh my god, that's a tumbling stonefly. But at the same time, I think they're definitely, you know, they're used to seeing a stonefly in roughly this kind of shape. Uh, and like I said, this will help with a tungsten bead and some lead wire up front, which we're going to add here in a second. That will help a little bit as far as um, getting hung up a bunch. I agree, Steve Spurgeon. Ever 200R, never 200R. Yeah, I do not care for the 200R personally. I know there's a lot of guys that love them. Um, I don't mind that hook in smaller sizes, but in the larger sizes, I just um, I don't I don't really love the 200R. Uh, don't know why, but I just feel like I don't hook as many fish, and I certainly don't keep as many fish stuck uh, with that personally. But again, a hook is a hook. If it has a good sharp point uh, and it's roughly the right shape and size, you're probably going to be just fine with it. So again, we're back to our 25,000 sled wire. Uh, just pulled off a little length here, and I'm going to start wrapping. Wrap up a bunch, pop that off. One of the many reasons I like lead wire, outside of obviously additional weight, when you're dealing with a traditional countersunk tungsten bead, that lead wire is going to help center the bead. So you'll see, when I don't have any lead wire in there, it can kind of there's a lot of play in it. When I slide the lead wire up into it, uh, that bead's a lot more secure, a lot more solid. So again, we're back to our UTC-70. I'm going to start that on the back side. Wrap through our lead wire. And again, back down through our lead wire. And again, back down. We'll break off our tag. Go for a little bit of our super glue again. Brush that on. And run one or two more sessions of thread through it. There it is again. Oh, a little sharp section of something there. Okie dokie. Stand by. Thanks for your paint. Alright. Might end up changing this uh, spool. Might have gotten into a little uh, bad section of thread. Very, very soft. Trim off my 85 thread tags because I kept breaking them. And work our way rearwards. Alright. Now that we're through that debacle. Alright, so thread is now at the index point of the hook. Uh, so index point on average for most hooks is going to be roughly right where the bend of the hook is. So in this case, like I said, when I'm letting my thread hang vertically, we're right at the bar of the hook. That's usually right where the bend of the hook starts. That's a nice little gauge for you as your time flies. So we're going to go back to our tailing material here in a second. And in this case, I need this guy here. Oh, changed our mode on the light. There you go. So we'll pull out our life flex again. Again, span flex, round rubber, silly legs, whatever.
whatever you have on hand, whatever your local fly shop has on hand, it's all going to work just fine. So I've cut off a half section from our zip tied area, cut that in half, and then we're going to take the middle of that section, and tie that in. Then we're going to take that and double it back over. Tie that in. Alright, so now we've got ourselves a tail tied in. We're going to switch back to our clearly very old variegated chenille. It's UTC 70. They're uh, Brian. And yes, Vivas is very good stuff, Dave. Normally I don't have any issues, but like I said, I got into a little, uh, I don't know if I got some glue on the thread and it wasn't stretching. I don't know what the heck was going on there, but like I said, we're, we're back in business. So, we've now secured ourselves our piece of old, dry chenille. We're going to tie that forward. Again, this is medium-sized variegated chenille and coffee black. We're going to get that up to about the halfway point, roughly. There's a lot of different ways to do it. This is, happens to be the way I like to do it. Secure that off. Next, we're going to reach for another section of our life flex. One, two, and turn it backwards. Oop. One, and two over the top. All right, once you have them seated, kind of pull, get them situated the way you want, add some tension, one, two, three, right in front of them, locked into place. All right, next, we're going to, again, jump forward. We're tying essentially the exact same fly, but uh, on a different hook with a bead now. And I'll fish these quite differently. You know, a lot of it, again, as I mentioned earlier, comes down to where you're fishing, how deep your water is, etc., etc., etc. All right, and our third set of legs. Again, I'm trying to put about one eye length between them. I kind of messed that up on the first one. But, you know, at the end of the day, we'll still fish just fine. Get that situated. Get that situated. Pull it into position. Tighten down. And we're good. Now we're going to go back to our chenille. Find ourselves our last section. And use the chenille to split them and splay them out. Good. Go to our middle section again. Split that with the thread, or excuse me, the chenille. Finish that off here. Secure our chenille and tie it off. Now you'll notice on this one, because of the bead, I didn't add the forward facing antenna. Some people are very hung up on the fact that, you know, stoneflies have a certain look to them. But I've seen many stoneflies without legs, without tails, without antenna. Uh, you know, fully living flies, not something I'm finding, you know, dead or, you know, shuck. If you'd like to add the antenna to it, it's certainly very simple. Uh, all you're going to do is you're just going to tie those antenna on before you add that bead. You know, so you, you put your bead on, slide it back, tie your antenna on facing forward. Um, and then slide the bead over top of it. But a lot of times, again, I, you know, I'm kind of lazy when it comes to tying some of these flies. You know, a lot of places where I'm fishing stoneflies, on average, it's going to be some higher water. It's going to be some deeper water, some some bigger water. And I I can promise you that the fish cannot see or, or they don't really know exactly what's going on there. So this exact style pattern right here that I've just finished. That fish is just fine. Uh, but if you do want to tie the antenna on, uh, like I said, I'll show you on the next pattern we're going to do how to add those antenna. So that's, again, a 
bead head, weighted, you know, curved shank. So you'll notice when the fly is completed, you don't really have, you know, it's not as noticeable that curve when you fill that up with the chenille. Um, but again, just another way to kind of get a jig hook effect. You know, it's going to ride more like this in the water column um, and not get hung up maybe quite as much. But I, as my good buddy Justin always tells me, um, you know, jig hooks find wood just as well as your traditional hook. All right, moving on. Now we're going to do a proper little mini sized um, girdle bug. So this hook right here is going to be an Umqua X series, uh, 60 degree jig. This happens to be a size 6. You can also use uh, right here in my hands. This would be a, uh, it's not really a very good way to hold it. There you go. That's going to be a TMC 403 BLJ. Very, very similar, as you will notice, side by side. Extremely similar hooks. The difference with the X-Series jig, it has a barb. I still end up crimping the barbs, obviously, but uh, they do make this in a 6 versus most traditional jig hooks are only manu manufactured to an 8. I end up uh, using both a lot, but... I definitely like the uh, the little bit longer shank, a little bit wider gap, a good bit. So, as I mentioned beforehand, if I were to tie antenna on with a bead, now this happens to be a jig hook, as you can see, there's a 60 degree jig eye coming down here. If this was not a jig hook, I would slide this back. If this was a traditional straight eye hook, I would start my thread right here, and then I would simply add my antenna. You know, cut my thread, tie a set of antenna in, like so. Again, just like I do the tails in the middle, wrap it back a bit, and then go forward. This is one of the reasons I do like using 70 or 6, or excuse me, 8 odd or something thin, because I'm not building up a whole lot of bulk. So you can kind of see how that looks. Imagine that eye going straight forward. You can tie that in. And then what you would do is you would you know, whip finish and then slide your bead up and forward. However, with a jig hook, you can see the problem. When you slide the eye, excuse me, slide the bead forward, you end up with your antenna facing downwards because of a 60 degree jig. So what I like to do with these is I'll tie those forward facing antenna on at the end if I add them at all. And in this case, I will just for a... Uh, the sake of the video here. So, like I said, I have a size 6 Umqua X500 five, jig hook in here, and now we're going to go for some 20 thousandths lead. Again, you can use 25 thousandths, but slightly smaller hooks, slightly smaller gauge. I'm going to jump down at 20 thousandths, make a whole bunch of wraps up the shank, break that off, make sure my jig hook and bead are situated correctly. The other nice thing I like about 20 thousandths on these smaller hooks uh, with these big beads, like I said, this is a 3 sixteenths, is if I push really hard forward, I can actually seat that lead wire up into that slot. And that does a couple things. A, it puts more weight forward, so it's going to help the jig invert, uh, but it's also going to do a really nice job of securing that bead into place. So we've got our thread here. We're going to start that just behind the uh, lead. We're going to run that through the lead, back down the lead. And just a quick side note, um, I am tying with a Tiemco ceramic bobbin size standard. I also love the Tiemco ceramic bobbins in the fine size. Um, I will say this, if you're watching this video and you plan on maybe picking up a new bobbin, to the best of my knowledge, we do not have these in stock at the shop right now. We've been shipping a ton of stuff, and uh, just a thank you to everyone who has purchased from us uh, over the last few weeks. This has obviously been a very strange time for everyone, uh, and any support that you have given to our shop, your local fly shop, whatever it may be, uh, is certainly very, very much so appreciated. So again, thank you very much for that. But I will say, if you are looking to pick up one of these bobbins, I tie with these almost exclusively these days. 
Uh, we can certainly order them for you. It will be a little while coming from Umqua, obviously the United States distributor for Tiemco. Uh, but um, in my opinion, the best bobbins on the market. Uh, not very expensive, and uh, they just happen to do a really, really nice job. So, moving on now, like I said, with this being a mini size uh, jig stonefly here, we're going to take that same, you know, half of a half. Like I said, we take our, our length here, cut that off right at the zip tie, cut that in half, and then we're going to double it over and cut it in half again. In this case, I'm going to double it over and cut it in half yet again. This is a pretty short shank to work with relative to the larger sizes that we have been dealing with. So now I have a quarter of this half. All right. So we're going to bring our thread to the back. We're going to tie that in. In the middle. And then we're going to double this over and uh, secure this again. And you'll see that you're dealing with a nice little split V there. Hopefully that shows up on camera here. So once we've done that, this time we're going to continue to use the variegated chenille in brown and coffee. Uh, you can tie these flies, as, as I mentioned earlier, in a lot of different colors, a lot of different style chenilles. However, I must say 99 maybe percent of the time that I'm fishing these things, I really do like um, the brown and coffee, or excuse me, black coffee uh, colorway. So this is a really cool product. This is from Hairline. Uh, it's called Flyfish Foods Small Stonefly Chenille. It's the exact same thing that we have been working with, albeit much newer, and hopefully will not break nearly as easy as the other one did. Uh, but it's, it's a smaller size. So this would be closer to your kind of standard chenille that you're used to seeing. You know, obviously, regular ultra chenille comes in micro, standard, and medium. We have been tying with medium for the larger, longer shank flies. In this case, we're going to jump down to the, you know, they call it small stonefly because, again, that is, relatively speaking, a small stonefly. Uh, but this is closer to your more standard length chenille, or excuse me, size chenille. So, just as always, I've stripped off the coating from this material here and I'm going to tie in just this exposed base again build up a little bit of a thread taper I like a slight bit of a thread dam thread ramp down from the lead here helps smooth things out from an underbody again I know this is not super super clear uh, I'm just happy to be using my laptop's camera I said this is new for us and I certainly appreciate everyone who's tuning in and kind of bearing with us here all right so once I've gotten that uh, kind of smoothed out I'm gonna take my chenille and I'm gonna begin wrapping just as before, tight touching turns directly in front of one another. We go up to roughly the 50% point and one or two wraps of thread to secure that and tie that off. Now we'll go back to our light flex here. Again, I happen to be using brown. Black works great. Uh, you know, brown, copper, olive really does not matter. And we're going to take that section, the half, cut that off from the zip tie, and then we're going to cut those half sections, or I guess really quarter sections, into smaller parts. Going back to tying the exact same process that we have been, uh, get one or two tight X wraps on there, pop that off, apply some tension, 
a few wraps, and that's secured in place. We're going to do the exact same thing again. In this case, because we're dealing with smaller chenille, I'm going to have these wraps, or excuse me, these legs closer to one another than I did the last time. If I can catch the second side, there we go. Just like that. I was just talking with my good friend and co-worker John Parisi before this all started. And he was mentioning how he likes to tie his rubber legs legs in, in one big bundle. So he takes all three and ties them in all at the same time in one particular spot and then just uses the chenille to split them. Uh, and that's pretty darn similar to what I'm doing here. Amy, you would always recover. It's just thread. Break it as many times as you want. Apparently, I'm really good at breaking thread tonight. Like I said, I don't know what the heck was happening with that one little section there. But, moving on. So, we're going to take our chenille, and then again, using the chenille to separate and splay out our legs. Put one wrap between each one. There's another one here, and another one here. And then now one additional one here. Actually, before I tie that off completely, I forgot I was going to add more antenna. So, like I said, a lot of times you've now seen me twice just <laughs> advance the front without antenna. I, I really don't know that they matter at all, but they do make the flies look cooler. So we're going to add this antenna in again here. And I've done the same thing that I did for the tail. tie that in and the nice thing about using the jig hook is that these beads are situated at an angle where your antenna if you tie them in like this don't really look that off kilter they kinda just lay right over top of the bead now we're gonna switch back to our chenille again we're gonna make one two more wraps directly behind the bead help use the chenille to pull that last bit of rubber leg or again span flex, life flex really in this particular excuse me, situation down and then once we've secured that with a few wraps of thread we're going to pull it off. So I don't know how many of you saw that. The one thing to be aware of with the smaller fly fish chenille uh, is that it's very easy to pull the material out. So I just wasted obviously two inches of material there but you know, chenille's cheap, and uh, it helps keep making sure that I'm drinking beer here. Uh, so continue to <laughs> purchase as much fly fish, food, fly fish food, small chenille, from TCO Fly Shop as you certainly can. So, now, like I said, I think we're in a pretty good place here. We've got all of our uh, legs tied in. We have a nice little splayed looking stone fly here. And then I'm going to finish with a quick, quick whip finish. Typically, typically speaking, um, you know, I finish most of my flies with a little bit of super glue right on the thread, as many of you may have seen from our new uh, East Coast Hatch Master series that we've been working on. If not, be sure to check that out. Uh, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel here. Uh, the more likes and subscriptions we have, the more things that YouTube allows us to do as far as, you know, live videos and things like that. Big Mark, what's going on, my friend? Thank you very much for checking it out, and uh, appreciate the kind words. So now, we're going to take our legs here, and we're going to cut them all to length. Oh, my fiskers here are getting a little, a little dull. And then we're going to take our antenna and cut them to length. The length that you tie and cut these things to is 100% up to you. I don't, there's no right or wrong answer. Uh, just as I said before, with hooks, with rubber leg material, with the chenille, whatever your eye likes is just fine. Don't stress about, oh, it has to be this or it, it, it can't be that, you know. It, 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 it really is completely up to you. And for me, I, I just eyeball these these uh, 
these legs, like for instance, have a little long piece there, but you know, to me, that's a pretty good looking length. So you'll see I have defined tails, I have defined antenna, and I have a set of three legs on this size 6 jig hook. And again, don't be afraid to stick to the traditional jig hooks. Like I said, this is a TMCO 403 BLJ, uh, an Umqua C400 or C450, both in a size 8 are great options. Uh, TCO jig hooks and a 403 BLJ are a great option. Um, Eric's Partridge, there's a lot of different, uh, you know, a lot of different options out there that, that work really, really well. And there we have it. So, like I said, we started with a traditional rubber legs here. No bead, you know, 25 thousandths lead wire on a size 6, 52, 62. We switched to our Daiichi 1730, slightly bent shank, as you can kind of see here, with a 3 16th black tungsten bead. Again, add your antenna if you like. I just did it the way I t traditionally do it and didn't put a, a, a set of antenna on there. And then again, uh, you have the smaller, uh, you know, micro jig version. So even though this isn't a traditional jig hook, the 1730, it's going to fish like that. Like I said, on average, it's going to run like this in the water column. Um, you know, your tippet's going to be coming off here on an angle. Anyone who fishes dr jig hooks or tungsten weighted flies consistently, you'll notice that your, you know, your tippet has a tendency to kind of run on a roughly a 45 degree angle up and off of this eye here. And this is essentially, you know, my jigged version of a big stone fly. Uh, it forces it to ride like this. You know, if I'm on an, in on an indicator system and I'm fishing, uh, obviously a lot more length between, I'm going to get a lot more kind of free-flowing movement. And then if you want to, again, a proper jig hook, you know, you end up with either the Umqua X-Series like I talked about. Again, not sure that we have these in stock in the company, but if you're looking for them, we can almost certainly get them. Uh, just, again, appreciate all of the orders, but also really appreciate the patience at this point. It's been really, really a crazy time for everyone, and, uh, you know, your fly shop employees, whether that's TCO or your local shop, uh, it's no different for those guys and gals, for sure. So um, just make sure that we're, you know, we're uh, kind of all on the same page. Again, the Daiichi 1730 in a size 6, 8, 10, 12, all the way up. I don't think they go above a 6, um, but, you know, I, I really fish in 6, 8, 10 most of the time. And then the UTM code 52, 62 here. I fish these primarily 4, 6, 8, 10. Uh, 4 is big for sure. Uh, it's a pretty specialized fly for me in the East Coast. When I go to Montana, I fish a lot of 4s. Um, I fish a ton of big, heavy stone flies, specifically during salmon flies, you know, whether you're on the Madison, the Yellowstone, the Big Hole, or whatever it may be. Uh, that's a really, really great option out there. And again, the, as I mentioned, X-Series, great new series of hooks from those guys over at Umqua. Or uh, that's also an X-500 here. I was looking for a 403 bag, but I don't have one. Uh, like I said, really a lot of different options. And again, feel free to tie these on a variety of sizes and colors. Um, I'm trying to see. Right here. So this is how I organize all my stuff. Big, giant Ziploc bags. Uh, perfect example. Fly fish food, sh small stone fly chenille, and black purple. This is a great option if you're going to be steelhead fishing. I tied a number of these, caught a number of steelhead on them this year. Uh, also, stock trout in an area where they might see stoneflies. And plenty of wild fish, too. I mean, there's nothing to say. I mean, you look at everyone fishing out west these days, whether that's Montana, Idaho, Colorado, Wyoming, whatever it may be, purple is obviously a killer color. Uh, you know, you get your purple hazes. Um, I know George Daniel uh, just put up a super cool little video of him tying a purple uh, you know, rainbow warrior. And that's, uh, again, a, a really, it's a popular color, and that's another thing you can do these in. And as I mentioned before, for anyone just tuning in, dark olive coffee, brown, yellow, you know, the, the small stonefly chenille and coffee black. 
your traditional variegated chenille coffee black. Again, from Eric's Fly Shop, West Yellowstone, Montana. I Again, I'm not 100% certain, but I do believe these guys are no longer in business, which is a real shame. Got a lot of great fly patterns, some really nice guys working in there. Um, but, you know, any type of sparkly, again, I think you can kind of see that there, yeah. A little bit of sparkle and flash worked into that tinsel. Uh, that's a really great option. And, uh, you know, as far as legging material, again, for anyone just tuning in, This is Hairline Life Flex in brown. Uh, you've got Span Flex from Wopsy. You've got Silly Legs again from Wopsy. You've got Loco Legs from Hairline. You've got a ton of different options. Round Rubber from a variety of manufacturers. Don't get hung up on individual materials for any given fly pattern. You know, very rarely uh, do I think of materials as the make or break point for a fly. There's a lot of substitutes. There's a lot of different options that you can use. Uh, occasionally, you're going to run into a fly where, yes, a given material and a given color and size makes a difference. But the vast majority of the time, you know, think of fly tying as, uh, it's, you know, people say it's an art form. I have a hard time believing that, or not necessarily believing that, but more so agreeing with that, um, as I am not artistic in the slightest. Uh, I look at you know, fly tying the way, um, you know, the great Russ Madden of Michigan always says, you know, I look at materials and I figure out a way to apply them to a problem that I want to solve. And I see no difference between a silly leg, a span flex leg, a life flex leg, or a rubber leg. They all work the same way. They're soft, rubbery-esque materials that are going to tumble around the current, provide an illusion of movement, an illusion of life. Uh, and it's really important, I think, to just, you know, tie with what you have, tie with what's available, you know, one shade of sulfur yellow dubbing versus another shade of sulfur yellow dubbing is not going to make or break, you know, whether you catch fish or not, it's really about your presentation and what's going on there. So, uh, again, to everyone who has been purchasing from, on, uh, from us, whether that's curbside pickup, over the phone, you know, online orders, thank you, thank you, thank you, really, truly appreciated right now in this, this crazy time we're dealing with. Uh, and again, thank you so much to everyone, uh, who tuned in tonight. Um, if you have any questions, you know, now's a great time. I'm going to hang out for the next few minutes here and finish my, uh, Lawson's <laughs> sip of sunshine. Uh, if you have any questions about fishing these flies, about tying these flies, questions about anything, uh, certainly let me know. Doug Bear, my man, I uh, completely agree. Getting creative is part of the fun. Um, you know, your stone looks like a great anchor fly for pen, PA Rivers, like the Delaware, or pens. That's completely true. Like I said, I'm on average fishing these flies where I have stone flies, but at the same time, uh, as was perfectly proven by my good friend Matt the other day, if there's no stone flies, they're certainly going to come and eat them. <laughs> uh, so it, it's just something they're, they're, they're curious about. It's something that they might be a learned kind of pattern uh, to say that they are, you know, they're there and uh, it's, you know, it's a recognizable food source. So certainly uh, give them a go on your local trout stream. Time a lot of colors, a lot of sizes, a lot of weights. You know, that's really uh, the, the biggest thing to think about is, you know, from a nymphing perspective, something that, again, George Daniel, you know, taught me a number of years ago is, is weight is the most important thing. Uh, you know, as I mentioned in that hatch matcher series, you know, it's really something that, you know, I was very lucky to, to work with Paul Weimer, with George Daniel, with Steve Spurgeon, with, um, you know, Gavin Robinson, with Wes Osborne, Chris Frangiosa, you know, John Parisi, you know, my, my current coworker, he's a fantastic angler, a really great tire. I learn a ton from other people. And, you know, it's important to stay open um, to new ideas, to new patterns, to new techniques, to new styles of tying and fishing. And, yeah, Doug Bear, I sometimes jig them. I completely agree. Uh, you can animate the, the crap out of these flies. You know, bounce them around, make them look like they're alive. Um, I guess now that I'm not tying, I can do this again. Um, you know, really, there's no limit 
to what you can do with a lot of these different fly patterns. Um, and that's why, like I said, one of the most important things for me is, is a variety of weights. You know, when, when fishing with George, you know, you, you watch a guy at that level, you see what is capable, you know, what, what, what can happen when you're really in tune with what's going on around you. And, you know, the, the thing that I've always loved about George, um, and a lot of guys I fish with, Brian Wolfkill, you know, Tom Daubert, a lot of guys have taught me a lot of stuff. You know, they all approach things differently. Um, and that's really, really important to think about that. You know, Austin Randecker, Kyle Whiney, the list goes on and on and on. Guys, Sam Galt, obviously, from our state college shop, has taught me more about, you know, trout fishing than most anyone I know. And you, you can't be closed-minded about stuff. You really have to be able to think about, you know, the given situation in front of you, the conditions, the, the you know, river flow, whatever it may be. Think about what you think is going to work, and then think about something completely new and different, and try both of them, because you will be wildly surprised. I mean, trout do crazy things that we, we can't always predict, um, and having the ability to, you know, be adaptive, be dynamic, as George would always say, um, makes a humongous difference. And I think that that's, you know, one of the biggest, most important, crucial parts of, of this whole program is, you know, just be open, try different things, try new things, ask questions, uh, and, and try to stay humble, you know, uh, try to, you know, the minute you think you have a trout stream figured out, it's, it's going to kick your butt, guaranteed, guaranteed. I've had it happen to me so many times, um, and, you know, that's like I said, the cool thing about fishing is that there's so many different ways to do this, and um, you know, as they say, a million ways to skin a cat. There's a there's a lot of ways to do this, and these just happen to be three different flies that I incorporate into my fishing a lot. You know, they like said a, a traditional, lightly weighted or even unweighted. I'll tie these without lead wire sometimes. Very rarely. Uh, that's usually an out west kind of dry dropper thing, but sometimes. And then obviously, you know, varying sizes. These are essentially the two of the exact same flies right here with the Curve Shank 1730 and the Jig Hook. Um, one's significantly bigger. They're both a size six, but you know, size six does not is it's not an equal thing. Um, and fish them a lot of different ways. You know, swing them. Try let it let them swing at the end of the drift. You'd be surprised what happens. As Doug Bear, you know, uh, of of Orvis uh, fly fishing told us, you know, jig them, twitch them, strip them. Even you know, you'd be surprised what happens. So uh, again, thank you very much to everyone that tuned in. Uh, I'm going to hang out for another couple minutes here, like I said, answer any questions that pop up. And, uh, yeah, like I said, hope everyone's staying safe out there, enjoying uh, a little bit of free time and some, some fishing if they can get it in. And to uh, anyone who's still out there working, certainly thank you very much. And who anyone who is looking for any kind of fly fishing, fly tying stuff, give us a call, support TCO, support your local fly shop, whether, you know, whether that's us or not, um, everyone's everyone's in a a new kind of very unique situation right now. So check it out and uh, be sure to, like I said, help everybody out. So thank you very much. And uh, like I said, I'll, I'll hang out for another two, three, four minutes here to see if any questions come in. And we'll go from there. So. Uh, John Parisi asking what we should tie next week. I completely agree. Um, for those of those of you that are left right now, if anyone has any questions or uh, recommendations for next week, certainly let us know. Um, I'm not sure who's going to do the tie next week, um, but whoever is planning to do it uh, certainly has <laughs> a lot of options ahead of them. Um, so if anyone has any requests or, or specific things they'd like to see us do, certainly uh, let us know. Thank you for the uh, kind words and the, all the nice comments coming in, guys. Appreciate it.
Only one beer on the video. Josh, yeah, thank you. A couple before, I'm going to have a couple after. <laughs> You just wish you could tie a mop fly, Maddie. Brendan Game Changer Spurge, yeah. Uh, we'll see if he's back safely from Montana yet. Brendan drove on out to Craig, Montana. No sculpins have been tied yet, Doug. Yeah, no streamers. Uh, last, It's only been two weeks. Last week, Neil did a uh, caddis larva pattern. And then, uh, like I said, I did a variety of different stoneflies tonight. So, sculpin's definitely a good idea for sure. A lot of different options, a lot of different variations, you know, sizes, weights, patterns, etc. Definitely can do that. I said we'll uh, give this just a few more minutes. Any last minute questions come in, and, and the other thing too is if anyone watches this video later and has any questions, um, feel free to give us a call at the fly shop. Certainly shoot me an email. It's Lenny L E N N Y at T C O flyfishing dot com is my email. Uh, you know, check it almost every day. <laughs> you didn't hear that, Tony or Chris, my bosses, but uh, m most every day I check that. And um, like I said, more than happy to uh, help you out with whatever kind of questions you have or anything you're looking for. And again, as I've said a number of times, these are very unprecedented times for us here in the the entire United States, and especially in our little industry here, our little little kind of niche of uh, fly fishing. If you have uh, any Anything that at all you're looking for right now, certainly give us a call. Be more than happy to do whatever we can um, to get you that kind of product and, and hopefully get you out there on the stream and enjoying some, some time fishing. In the meantime, there you go, Josh, on my second beer. Helltown Rapture, uh, Pittsburgh-based brewery. A good, good friend of mine, Brent Sullivan, turned me on to that. Uh... Great beers. If you've never never had them, look them up. Try to find them somewhere. Like I said, I got these in my uh, local beer distributor in Bryn Mawr, Bryn Mawr Beverage. Great guys. Shout out to them. All right. Well, it seems like, uh, like I said, we're not getting a whole ton of new questions. So, again, thank you very much for tuning in tonight, guys, uh, and gals, obviously, for sure. Um, you know, there's, you know, not a not a groundbreaking new style of tying by any means. Like I said, the past rubber leg has been around for a long, long time, but great pattern. Uh, you know, a lot of options, a lot of variations, a lot of variables that you can kind of tweak and play with. And, um, again, thank you very much for tuning in tonight. And uh, we'll hope to see you next Friday night. We're going to continue to try to do these as frequently as we can here, uh, especially during these, again, crazy times we're dealing with. And uh, hopefully we will see you guys soon either in the shops or on the streams. So thank you very much. Have a great night. Everybody stay safe, stay healthy out there, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you again.